someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently. But watch yourself, or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. And even, or excuse me, each one should test his own actions. Then he can take pride in himself. Without comparing himself to somebody else, for each one should carry his own load. Anyone who receives instruction in the world must share all good things with his instructor. Do not be, excuse me, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. The one who sows to please his sinful nature, from that nature will reap destruction. The one who sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time ye, we will reap a harvest if, key word is if, you do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. See what large letters I use to, as I write to you with my own hand. Those who want to make a good impression outwardly are trying to compel you to be circumcised. The only reason they do this is to avoid being persecuted for the cross of Christ. Not even those who are circumcised obey the law. Yet they want you to be circumcised that they may boast about your flesh. May I never boast in, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is a new creation. Peace and mercy to all who follow the rule, even to the, Isra to the Israel of God. Finally, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you in spirit, brothers. Amen. Father, this morning we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord God, that your word wants to do something. Your word wants to be planted in good, fertile soil. So, Lord, we make our hearts ready today. We make our hearts ready to hear and to know and to understand the word of God. And, Lord, I pray that as the Holy Spirit unveils it, as he speaks through me, I pray, Lord, that it would be uh, completely your word, not mine. It would be something you want our body here today to hear, not mine. And so, Lord, we surrender to that. We humbly accept your help and your power and your ability because we know we can't do this on our own. And so, Lord, we love you and praise you and thank you for your word. And we ask your blessing on it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. This morning, my, if I were to put a title on this, I would say, Dead to the World. Dead to the world. It's what Paul came to. Paul came to a place where he definitely was wanting to be dead to the world. You know why? Because the world will drag you down. It will take you down. It will cause you to be ineffective as a believer. Has anybody ever backslid? Or feel like you backslid? You go, man, how did I get here? One step at a time. Going the wrong direction. That's how you got there. It's not hard to figure out why. Because when you begin to fill the void that God wants to fill with other things of this world, that's what drags you away. It entices you. It causes you to have some feelings connected to it. it causes you to have some kind of a, a, attraction to it. I mean, I used to, to be honest, there wasn't hardly a candy bar I didn't like it. As long as it didn't have coconut and it didn't have nuts in it, I, for the most part, I, was, I liked most candy bars. But you know as well as I do that over the years, Snickers has definitely been my favorite. But you know what? I had to come to a time where I had to cut the tie. And Snickers no longer had its place in my life. Why? Because it made me look like a, you know, something else. It, made, it, it, it didn't do me well. And uh, so it's just one of those things I had to cut. I had to pull away from it. And I'm very thankful that I was willing to let that go because what I find interesting is as Paul writes to the Galatian church, one of the things that was a problem with the Galatian church is they wanted to go back to some of the old ways of doing things that didn't work before. 
They wanted to go back under the law. They wanted to go back under circumcision where you had to be circumcised as, as a believer. You had to be circumcised and uh, it just, it didn't produce anything. But God wants to do more than just do a physical circumcision. He wants to do a circumcision of your heart. He wants to take your heart, what you believe, not your physical heart, the heart of you that causes you to live, wake up and do what you do every day, whatever causes you to enjoy what you do. He wants to take that heart and he wants to begin to carve away things that absolutely are taking you away from him or eventually will take you away from him. And he wants to begin to cut those things off. He wants to begin to remove those things. Why? Because he knows that a heart that is divided will one day not follow him. A heart that's not completely, completely circumcised where God has his way, when God has his purpose, when God has his, his agenda to be able to be fulfilled. When God can do that, you have a circumcised heart. Why? Because I've circumcised it to him. I haven't circumcised it to the world. And the circumcision to the world literally means I just attach to anything and everything that makes me feel good. I attach my life to anything that causes me to do what I think is important. And no matter what God says, it doesn't matter. Now the reality is, is this. There's lots of believers that have problems with circumcision. Well, we're circumcised all right. But we're only circumcised to do what we like to do. Not what God wants us to do or designed us for. And so I have to come to the place where I allow God to begin to have this work in my life so I don't end up going back to where I was living in bondage or I was living in, in, uh, in destruction or I was living in some other form. I don't want to go back to that. Why? Because if it was that good, why did I have to be delivered in the first place? You see? And here's the other thing. No matter how long you've been a Christian, the old temptations of the things you used to be involved in will always try to come back to your life again and again. And if you allow them, they will begin to get attachments to your life where you will absolutely might all of a sudden begin to uh, do something. Let's just take some real practical examples. Has anybody ever drank when you were young, quit, and all of a sudden when you got older, you decided you want to drink again? Where'd that come from? From way back when you gave in the first time. Has anybody ever tried to quit cussing, quit for a while, and all of a sudden you've been around some people and kind of get careless, and all of a sudden, bang, you start shooting off these words that you don't, haven't used for years, and it's like, well, what's that all about? It's all because those things want to bring an attachment back to me. So here's, here's what I want you to recognize. In this passage, is Callie, come here. I'm going to use Callie because she's, she's, going to be, she's going to be bad thoughts. She's going to be the bad thoughts in my life. Well, everybody is smoking, drinking, and chewing. I'm going to get tired of that. <laughs> you know what I mean? So she's bad thoughts. So what Paul was really wanting to say is, I'm going to begin to cut off my... Hang on to my belt loop, won't you? Okay, so everywhere I go, bad thoughts came with me. All of a sudden, I meet Jesus one day, and Jesus says, Hey, Jeff, I think you need to, I think you need to get rid of those bad thoughts. Okay. Cut it out. And my attached my bad thoughts, and you just stay there because you're not attached to me anymore. And I can go wherever I want, and all of a sudden, those bad thoughts are staying right there. But then all of a sudden, one day, I get into a circumstance, and I don't guard my heart, and I don't guard my mind, and all of a sudden, my... Attachment that I let go of years ago, all of a sudden, because of what I said and did, begins to attach again. And I begin to walk, and it's like, huh, I get tired fast. I don't know why. Oh, man. I just don't know why, why it's got to be like this. I thought I gave that up years ago, but blankety, blank, blank, blank. What happened? I gave it liberty to reattach to me. And I didn't guard my heart, and I didn't guard my mind to keep that away from me. So what's going to begin to come back to you? Everything you thought you let go of years ago. Because the devil's never going to quit trying to get a hold of you. The devil's never going to quit trying to get, get a, a, an aspect of your life. So what needs to happen is, I need to cut those attachments off. Now here's the funny thing about people. Come here, Kelly. Stand there like you're a bad thought. <laughs> 
See that smile on her face? That's deceiving. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> well, you know what some people do? Some people take that into their own hands and they grab the attachment and they hook it up themselves. Because that's what I used to do. They didn't even have to work at it. I grab it and I attach it and I begin to drag it with. Why? Because I've got an attitude, I've got something wrong with my life, and absolutely, that's just because I was used to doing it that way, therefore I'm going to reattach it because that's where I'm comfortable. Familiar. Familiar, yes. So you see, it goes both ways. And Paul is going to demonstrate that in this passage of Scripture. Listen down. Be a good thought. <laughs> So Paul is writing all this stuff to the believers. Galatians is not written to the unsaved. He's writing to the believers, and he, he teaches us how to treat one another. He teaches us how to help each other when we're caught in sin and when we're going about life. And so I want to, just for the sake of time, I want to jump ahead to verse 3. If anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. That's the very first problem is when you think you're bigger than God says you are. When you think you're bigger, you think you can handle it without God's help. You're not spending time in prayer. You're not spending time in His Word. You're not even spending time in His presence. And all of a sudden you think, well, I can handle that. I've, I've done that before. And you know what? The reality is the devil can't wait for that moment to come to your life. You know why? Because he knows you can't defeat him by yourself. He knows you're helpless without himself, without God. You're, you're completely weak. You might seem like you're strong, but the devil just sits back and laughs. He chuckles. Wow, what a fool. What a fool. I can't believe the old trick is working again. And that's what the devil thinks when you walk away from your relationship with Jesus. That's why you are to never take a day off from your relationship with Jesus. Don't ever think that you won't be tempted or you won't fall into something that somebody else is doing. It's easy to look at their lives and say, Man, did you hear what Aaron and Lindy were doing? Man, I thought they had it. I thought they were better than that. <laughs> yeah, scratch your head a little more. Yeah, yeah. You know, pretty soon, it's like, well, what happened? Because God didn't go on vacation. God didn't, God didn't pull away and just say, well, I guess I'll just let them learn on their own then. No, he didn't do that. What he's waiting for is for you and I. Come here. Good heaven. This is going to be God now. I go, to, I go to Jesus and I hook him up. Now when I go, he goes. Why? Because I want my best friend with me. I want the one that can guide me and direct me. And I want the one that will lead me and whisper in my ear and remind me of everything I need to hear. So now from going from a bad habit, going to a good habit, I've got God with me. And now I can begin to, because I chose to attach myself to God. And when I do that, God will never depart from you. He'll never depart from you if you want him. If you don't want him, he'll unhook and let you go. Because you have a will of your own. And that's a dangerous place for all you young people here today. Do not ever tell God you don't want him with you. Do not ever do that. I promise you, you will painfully pay for it. I, I completely beg you. Do not tell God you don't want him. I don't care what your friends say. I don't care if you are friendless. You don't have a friend. You've got the best friend you, you could hook to. And you want to make sure you hang on to him. But you want to make sure that who you hook to and connect to is someone that absolutely, once again, will not lead you to stray. So he says in verse 3, If anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Remember what the word deceive means? It means hoodwinked. You've been duped. You've been told a lie and you took it hook, line, and sinker. Every fish that comes out of that lake is duped. He thought it was something good and all of a sudden he goes, Oh, I'm out of water. What in the world? I'm going to die. <laughs> and Jesus, or I mean the devil can't wait to get you hoodwinked where he hooks you and gets you out of the water, out of the work of the Holy Spirit so that you die. He doesn't want you and I to do that. 
So he wants us once again. He says, don't be deceived. Each one, verse 4, should test his own actions. What are you going to test it with? What your neighbor does? Absolutely not. What your parents did? Uh-uh. What your pastor does? Of course. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, your eyes are going to look right to Jesus. Why? Because he's the only one that did it perfect. He's the only one that did it absolutely right. So you hook up to them, and you hang on to him, and you hang on to his every word. Why? Because he will not deceive you. And he will cause you to look at your own actions so that when your actions are displayed, you're displaying something that you've got from God out of relationship rather than something from your own self that ruins people and speaks ill of them and hard of them. And that will be something we have to work on. I promise you, you'll have to work on it. And then he says in the second part of verse 4, he says, then he can take pride in himself without comparing himself to somebody else. Oh, wow. Well, so-and-so, they do this, and they're a Christian. Well, so-and-so, they do this, and they're a Christian. And your point is, did you ever see Jesus doing it? If you didn't see Jesus doing it, pretty good chance you shouldn't either. <coughs> Bottom line. And you might say, boy, that's, that's pretty narrow, isn't it? But hey, has there been anybody else that's told you to walk the narrow road? Wide and broad is the road that leads to what? Destruction. So get on the narrow road and learn how to stay there. Learn how to let God direct you with His Word and the Holy Spirit so you, can, you and I can stay there. So don't compare yourself to somebody else, for each one should carry his own load. In other words, at the end of my day, do you know the only person I literally can point my finger at and blame if something doesn't go right? Me. Why? Because I didn't ask you to make my decisions. I asked God and I asked myself what I should do, and therefore, if I don't like the decisions I'm getting, I've got only me to point my finger at. And I don't know about you, but I want to be the one that learns to be responsible, and that's a hard thing sometimes, be responsible to say, I don't care what anybody else does, I choose to follow Christ. I choose to walk with Him. I choose to let Him be my number one absolute focus so I can do exactly what God wants, when God wants, and how He wants it done. That's what I want, to, want us to focus on this morning. <coughs> because each one should carry his own load. Now there's other times when, uh, let's just, Jeff, if I could use you for example, when someone dies in your family, that's a heavy load. When somebody passes away, that's hard. There are times when you need to walk with them and help them carry their load. But as soon as that time is up, they need to continue to carry their load by themselves. Because one thing about it is, God never told you that he would give you something you couldn't carry. Did he? Come to me all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you what? Rest. Rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Callie, come here. So when you say you're going to yoke up with Jesus, she gets to be Jesus today. I'm going to yoke up with her. I'm going to hang on to her. Yoke up with me. Because Jesus will yoke up with me. This is his yoke. So when I walk with Jesus, it gets a whole lot easier. You know why? Because he knows how to do it. He's got all the strength. He's got all the wisdom. He's got everything I need. So he says, take my yoke. So when they yoke with me, I yoke, with him, yoke up with him, and we walk together. That's what Jesus said. Don't try and do it by yourself. Yoke up together so that you walk with him. And he, the invitation is everyone. Come to me all who are weary and heavy laden. Now that's my point. That's what I have to do. I have to go to him. He's waiting for me to go to him. So he says... Each one should carry his own load. Then he goes on with some more instructions. A man reaps what he sows. Don't be fooled by that. Every year, farmers go out and plant certain seeds in their fields, and guess what they harvest? Those kind of seeds. 
When you and I learn to walk through life, we can sow two kinds of seeds. One seed will be, will be good and one seed will be bad. We can sow either one. I can sow seeds that uh, lead me to destruction or I can do my own thing. I can go my own way. I can begin to do what I want. Or I can sow seed of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, which is the truth of God. And I can begin to sow that in my life and I'll reap eternal life, the Bible says. Let me read it for you so you know what I'm not... Pulling your leg. He says, um, verse 8, Although I am less than all of you, or excuse, less than all God's people, the grace of God, oh, the grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden from in God, who created all things. He says, what? I can't hear you. Are you in chapter 6 verse Oh, no, I was in chapter 2, 3. No wonder. No wonder it didn't make sense. No, wait a minute. Ah, I'm in Ephesians. No wonder. Pages got turned on me. I thought it didn't sound right. There we go. Ephesians 6, verse 7. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. The one who sows to please the sinful nature, from that nature will reap destruction. The one who sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. God told you what you're going to reap. So when you start getting things of the sinful nature, you shouldn't be surprised. Well, I don't know how in the world I ever got here. Yes, you do. You made decisions to go that way. And I'll tell you kids one more thing like I've always said. All you got to do is look at what older people are trying to quit and can't and never start. Amen. You might think I'm goofy or whatever. That's fine. But I promise you, if you stay away from the things everybody is trying to quit, those are the, in the church and those that are outside the church, go to some AA meeting at some time and just sit and listen to them. Go to, go to an addiction counselor one time and see what they're addicted to. It goes from everything in your mind to everything you say, everything you do. I mean, it is amazing what people are addicted to. But just don't ever open those doors. Don't ever open those opportunities for those things to come into your life. And you say, well, I'm strong enough. I'm old enough. I'm, I can make my own decisions. Apart from God, you're an you're a easy target for the devil. And it goes for you older ones, too. We're all an easy target once we begin to do something we're not designed to do. So we reap whatever we sow. Then he says, don't become weary in well-doing, reap a harvest. So, in other words, do what God's asked you to do. Don't do more. I don't know about you, but have you ever thought about looking back on your days and said, hmm, I wonder how many days I actually wasted doing something God never told me to do. How many days have I wasted doing something God never told me to do? You ever wondered that? Because I think it happens more than we realize. There have been days I've wanted to do things and it's like, God, I want to get this done. And he says, I've got to, I want to get this done. So you choose. So I have to choose which one I follow. And uh, I'm still working on it. Doesn't mean I do it perfectly. I never probably will, but I have to work on it. So then he says this, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. I just want to touch on this real quick. If you can't get along with your church family, something's wrong. And it's not on God's part. So you might as well go to Menards, get a ladder and get over it. Because it will ruin you. Because what that does is sometime when you're out talking in public and all of a sudden you bring up somebody that goes to your church, there's bound to be some unbelievers that can probably overhear you. And they would say, hmm, if that's what it's like going to their church, why would I ever want to go there? Just saying. If you're a family, you can't ruin each other and think you can still be a family. So shut up. Is that okay? Amen. 
or be a little more politically correct, be quiet. <laughs> you can tell who's nervous or laughing. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but you know what? That's easy for me to say today, but when I walk out this door, my flesh is going to want to come back up and start doing that again. And I have to commit, I have to submit that to the work of God. And will that benefit God? Not one bit. Not one bit. You're never going to benefit anybody by talking about somebody bad behind their back. Because where did you get that information? Your flesh. You didn't get that from God because God would never send that message. He's not a divider. He's a uniter. He's the one that brings us together. So where in the world did the church ever think that we could do that to one another and it would be beneficial? Come on, let's wake up. And let's control our flesh. Let's get it under the work of the Spirit. And I'm not blaming you. I'm just saying in general. The reality is, is that we've got to quit pointing our finger and quit destroying each other and start building each other up. Amen. And I don't care if they come to this church or not. If they're believers out in the world, you've got to go out there and build them up too. Yes. Amen. You can't tear them down and think that God's going to go out there and say, stamp of approval, stamp of approval, stamp of approval. Not a chance. God can't do that. It's against his nature. It's against his will. It's against everything he's designed us for. So we have to be very, very careful that we don't do that. For myself, I'm very careful of what I say about other preachers. Why? Because I know I'm going to be held accountable. I may not like what they do, but the reality is I need to be very careful about what I say about other pastors. So you need to be careful too. So then he says, I've got to get to where I really want to go today. So these guys were trying to get everybody to follow into this old pattern of living in Galatians chapter 6, verse 11 through 13, because they wanted to boast about their flesh. Well, that's the last thing God wants us to boast about. Verse 14 is the verse I want to get to, and then we'll be done. May I never boast except in the cross of, the, of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me. Come here, Callie. Callie's going to be the world. Go ahead and grab my belt. If Callie's the world, he said, the world is crucified to me. What does that mean? I kill it. Die. Fall on the ground. <laughs> it's crucified to me. It's dead. Crucifixion means a death. Lay down. See, it tried to get back up. We got, can't let that happen. <laughs> Act like you're dead. <laughs> so I have to be crucified to the world. That means that's my part. I have to be crucified to the world. I have to be willing to say, I don't care how long she's been attached to me. I don't care how many years I've been giving into this habit. I have to crucify the world so I can walk away without that dragon on my life. That's what Paul was writing. He says, you've got to be crucified. You've got to crucify that old way of living, that circumcised way of living that he talked about in ultimate relations. He says, I'm going to cut that off, and that I need to be crucified to the world. Hold on, Kelly, just stay there. May I never boast out except anything on the cross of Jesus Christ through which the world has been crucified to me. And come up here. And then I to the world. Yeah, Bill, there you go. Did you see it went both ways? Paul had to let go of his pedigree of who he was only to accept Christ. Because he had a perfect pedigree of being a Pharisee, a leader. And he had to crucify himself from all of that so that he could be individually owned and bought and paid for by Jesus Christ and Him alone, not from where He came from. That is so, so important that I learned to crucify... Well, yeah, you go ahead. Yeah, I think they got the picture. That I, I'm crucified to the world and the world is crucified to me. That when I go through the world, I, it doesn't, doesn't have the draw to me anymore. It doesn't have the pull to me. 
It, I, why? Because I've killed it. I've destroyed it. I've nailed it to the cross. It's crucified. It can't have its way in me anymore. Why? Because Jesus said, I need to be crucified like Christ. And Jesus Christ himself was nailed to a cross. The world put him there. But he see, he didn't stay there. He was brought down and he was crucified from the world because he went to be with his Father in heaven, where he's at right now, seated at the right hand of the Father. The world doesn't have a hold on him anymore, does he? So once again, I need to be crucified to the world and the world needs to be crucified from me. Why? Because both of them will deceive you and lead you down destructive, completely ruining your life choices. And if you and I are not crucified in those ways, we absolutely will not have a successful, fulfilling work. Okay. One more scripture. 1 Corinthians 15. Go back to your left just a few pages. 1 Corinthians 15. Verse 31. Paul wrote this in, to the Corinthian church. He said, I die every day. What? I die every day. What does that mean? That means every single day I come to the conclusion that the world will be detached from me and I'm detached from the world. Anything the devil would ever bring up to me, I am detached from. Why? Because I'm dying to what I want, and I'm living to enjoy everything that God wants. Major difference. So one Old Testament story that will fulfill this. Remember Samson? Had the anointing and the power of God upon him from when he was born. He was told specifically not to cut his hair. How hard is that? Is that really that hard to stay away from? Not really. Let your hair grow long and be perfect. Just go for it. But Samson chose not to listen to God. So what happened to Samson? Samson gave in to the temptation to tell Delilah his secret of his power, which he never should have done. And in the process of having that, she said, Samson, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. And all of a sudden, the world began to attach itself to Samson in a way he couldn't resist, in a way he couldn't give in, or a way he couldn't, he couldn't overpower. And you know what the next thing they found him as? stretched out from every limb on the ground with cords that took the world took him and stretched him out like a like a pancake and they mocked him and they made fun of him and they gouged his eyes out and why did that happen he was anointed he was powerful he was mighty in the lord there was nobody on earth like him you want to see how fast you can fall from where god has you to where you can be nothing samson a good example and the world will strap you down and he'll hold you and it won't let go very easy. I don't know about you, but I wonder exactly how long his hair had to grow back to get the power. Because they made mock of him because he was so big and strong, they put him on this mill where he would walk around and people would make fun of him time and time again until one day they forgot to cut his hair. And his hair got too long and all of a sudden, poof, came back. So God's in the redeeming purposes, isn't he? He knows how to redeem our life when we mess up. He knows how to, he's not going to condemn you forever. He knows how to redeem you, but you've got to want to be redeemed. I bet you how many times he walked around that driver saying, Oh Lord, if there's ever another day I could walk with you, I'd be glad to do it because I'm getting tired of this. This is not what I was designed for. I know that, but I'm caught in this, in this realm. And until you come, I'm just going to have to wait, I guess. I just have to do what I'm doing. They're making fun of me, and they're calling me names, and, and they're mocking me, and they're doing whatever. And guess what? One of these days, it's going to go boom! And it's going to be destroyed. Why? Because the power of God came back and redeemed the soul that was meant to be walking with God. Do you know that you were never meant to walk a day outside of his redemption? 
Not one day of your life was ever meant to walk away from God. Not one day was ever meant where you would go away from God. It was designed that you and I would walk with Him faithfully, consistently, all day long, every single day. That was what we were created for. So we could have fellowship with Him and we could have a relationship with Him. And because of that powerful relationship, those bonds of the world would never have their way with us. Amen. So be careful what you put your hand to. Young people, listen to me. Be careful what you put your hand to. Because it might be the very thing that straps you down where you can't live for God like you want to. I don't care how lonely you feel. I don't care how mocked you are. I don't care how, how mean people are to you. Don't worry about it. I know that's easy to say. Hard to do. I understand that. But if I could encourage you, that's what I would encourage you to do. Never give in to the temptations of the world. It'll strap you down and keep you from doing what you were designed to do. Let's all stay and pray.